This is the word of the Lord from Philippians chapter 1. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have, will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. Thanking everyone who last night participated in uh, the event at River Shoals, celebrating our 25 years with you uh, as your minister. <laughs> you know, Lane and I were talking about it this morning, and she said two words that described how she felt, and I thought, you know, it describes me as well. She said, overwhelming and unworthy. Overwhelming and unworthy. You know, as we walked into the, to the River Center, there slew shows, there was a, there was a harpist playing. <laughs> and both Elaine and I, you know, thought, man, that is plum fancy. Uh, being <laughs> two, two people from Louisiana, you know, two rednecks with uh, that music, I thought, I thought, you know, y'all are just wanting to send us to heaven with a harp playing. That's what I'm thinking, you know. The young lady, by the way, was very, very talented. Very, and you had incredible food. Uh, there was even a vegetarian table for us, which we noticed. Uh, so many kind words were spoken. Uh, one of my all-time favorite people in this whole wide world in all of my 41 years of ministry, Jackie, right down here, uh, shared a poem with us that just honored us and we appreciated it so much. Ed and Hayward had some very, very kind words to say. Y'all gave us a stack of cards in this beautiful sweet grass basket and uh, this afternoon or maybe tonight our daughter's with us she's leaving at 6 p.m today so we may not get to them all today but we're going to sit down and go through every one of them because they are so precious and especially want to thank you for for the monetary gift uh in when we got home we, we opened up the card that was given to us uh, by the elders and uh, it was a it was a generous gift and said we want you to use all of this on vacation and Elaine and I said we never dreamed on going on a vacation where we would spend this much money. So, you know, just, wow, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank uh, you. There was one card, though, that we were instructed to open as soon as we got home. And the reason we instructed to do it, and by the way, the card began by saying, we saved on the card to give you something potentially worth even more. And inside the card was a Powerball lottery ticket. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. We were laughing. We were laughing on the way home. Can you imagine if it was the winner? 
And after the celebration of 25 years, your preacher didn't show up the next morning. Wouldn't that be? <laughs> I, I would have been here. And by the way, I checked it this morning after I got up. And uh, we missed it by only 12 numbers was all we missed it by. So it was, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> but... The card, the card also said this, and I love this. It, it brought a tear to my eye. Well, if you know me, it brought a tear to my eye, and then I thought of something funny to go along with it. They said, but, they said, but even more valuable is having known you guys. And I thought, would their attitude changed if we won the money? <laughs> we should have kept that. You know, that was, I would have thrown a million or two your way, by the way, for doing that. I didn't know who it was. <laughs> the point is, it's all a matter of perspective, right? We are, we are in our second week in our series in November that we've entitled Joy No Matter What. And by the way, Kyle is going to, and did a wonderful job reading the scripture a while ago, Kyle is going to preach the last sermon in the series on November the 27th. Lane and I are headed to Louisiana for Thanksgiving with, with her family, mostly her family, and, and, and Rachel and Jason and the kids from Texas are coming up to join us. So we're looking forward to that. But we're making our way through the book of Philippians, in which Paul mentions the word joy or rejoice 16 times. Now, something I found interesting and didn't know till I studied this book again, and I don't think it's a coincidence, by the way, that Paul also refers to a person's mind or thoughts 16 times. Now, I tell you, I don't think that's a coincidence, and it's because the way that we think helps determine our joy. The way to joy begins with our perspective, the, our mind. I love John Ortberg tells a story about having been called to jury duty one time. By the way, my daughter, Rachel, who's here today, is tomorrow morning going to Judy, jury duty, right? Exactly. Nobody. <laughs> yeah, she's down here going, I'm not looking forward to that. Practically no one does, right? Most people will do anything they can to avoid jury duty. It is a pain. By the way, I told her to wear, wear a T-shirt that says, hang them high, and she'll be excused. But <laughs> John, Ortberg <laughs> John Ortberg tells that story. He said it was 9 a.m. on a Monday morning, and he writes, I was one of 150 unhappy campers sitting on plastic chairs crammed into a sterile basement room in San Mateo County Courthouse reporting for jury duty. We all had one thing in common. We wanted to be somewhere else. And then he writes, until Larry happened. Larry works for the government, and however much we pay him, John Ortberg says it's not enough. In a few short minutes, he won over the crowd of prospective jurors and infused us with a sense of honor and purpose. He said, I know you're all busy people, he said, but I want to say thank you. I want to tell you on behalf of the judges and our legal system and the county of San Mateo and really our nation, we're grateful for your service. And although almost no one, John Ortberg writes, is happy to be summoned for jury duty, Larry said it's actually incredibly meaningful and it's the foundation of a justice system in which people have a right to trial by jury of their peers. He told us the story about a 95-year-old woman who was no longer able to drive, but who took three buses to get to the courthouse so she could serve. And when she arrived, Larry asked her, did you call ahead like you're supposed to to find out if you're even needed for jury duty? She said, I couldn't. I have one of those push-button phones. Turns out she still had actually a rotary dial phone. Ortberg goes on to write, Larry reminded us of the nobility of justice and the long centuries of struggle for it and how even now people around the world are fighting, in some cases dying, for the right to exercise this privilege. And as he spoke, Ortberg said, people start, stopped texting, they sat up straight, they nudged each other and seemed inspired. And by the time my number was called, John Ortberg said, he's, he's a minister, by the way. He says, by the time his number was called, I was so excited to serve that when the judge asked me whether I could pronounce someone guilty, I told him I was a pastor and that according to the Bible, everybody was guilty. And he, <laughs> he said, I looked at the judge and said, I can even pronounce you guilty. And he goes on to write, I wasn't selected to serve on the jury. 
But he says at that point, a room of sullen, a room full of sullen, silent, phone checking, self important draftees had been transformed into a community of joyful patriots in a matter of minutes. He writes, when people left the courthouse that day, they were talking and laughing like old friends. Perspective is everything when it comes to joy, right? Zig Ziglar, who was a popular motivational speaker, he once coined the phrase stinking thinking. He said, nothing, nothing will jail your joy like stinking thinking. And one example of stinking thinking is when I expect life to line up according to my expectations, right? I mean, it would be so nice if life would cooperate. If people would simply cooperate with my agenda, if things would turn out the way I envisioned them, it would be so nice. But you know, time and time again, there are people who have the audacity to not behave the way I expect them to behave. Circumstances in my life have the audacity not to line up the way I expect them to line up. People don't show up when I expect them to show up and do things I expect them to do. So life fails to line up with my expectations. And often my joy is jailed because of that. And I have to admit to you, maybe some of you can relate to this. Sometimes it is over things that are not even very important. Just this last week, as I'm studying for this message, I'm in a hurry because I'm heading somewhere. And I get behind a guy at a light that apparently it took him two seconds longer than I thought it should for him to go after the light turned green. And I am thinking, what would you do? What would you do? I, I, I remembered that I was a minister. <laughs> and, and, and I said, come on, man. Come on, man. The week before that, uh, I was having breakfast at Lizard's Thicket when my order took longer than I expected. In fact, the two tables nearest me had their order. I had ordered before them, but they had their order long before I did. And I thought, man, that is the unpardonable sin. (laughs) But I want you to know, now that I've gotten older, I listen to the Holy Spirit a whole lot quicker than I once did when I was younger. Because I I imagine standing one day before the Lord and explaining to him why I damaged my Christian witness over a waitress that was too slow in bringing my order, right? That's worth losing your joy over, isn't it? (laughs) Here's the first point. Joy, no matter what, means not allowing things which I cannot control to control me. (laughs) If you take nothing else out of this lesson, please, please remember this one. It is not allowing things which I cannot control to control me. A huge part of spiritual maturity is just that. Not allowing things I can't control to control me. As Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi, he finds himself in a situation that's out of his control. This wouldn't have been part of his plan. This was not on his bucket list, being accused and arrested for a crime for which he didn't commit, being chained to a Roman Praetorian guard day and night and waiting for who knows how long to have his trial was not anything he ever wanted to do. It's not anything he would have chosen. So he finds himself in an unfair situation over which he has no control, but The situation has no control over his joy. He's in a situation in which he has no control, but the situation has no control over his joy. While he's in a situation he he would never have chosen, he still says in verse 18, 118, I will continue to rejoice. You say, why? That's incredible. How is that possible? It's because Paul had this perspective that says, I can't control the outcome, but I can control my outlook. I can't control my outcome, but I can control the outlook. I can't control what's going to happen, but I can continue to rejoice. See, there's a way of approaching life that's guaranteed to make you miserable when life fails fails to line up with your expectations. Guaranteed to make you absolutely miserable when people and things don't line up with what you want. And then there's another way of life There's another way of living and approaching life that's guaranteed to fill you with joy no matter what. And Paul chooses the latter. 
In other words, his identity and his mission transcends his circumstances, always. That's his perspective. And each of us right now, we have a story inside that we're telling ourselves about our life. We have this perspective, this internal dialogue that's going on every day in our life. And the story that you're telling yourself each day depends on your perspective. Because some of us see joy as an outcome that we're waiting to happen. That we're waiting for circumstances to line up and people to line up so, so that our expectations are met and we can finally be happy. And again, the problem with that is people refuse to obey me. Circumstances refuse to line up the way that I want them to. And so the question is this, do I see joy as an outcome or as a decision? Do you see joy as an outcome or as a decision? Spiritually mature people see joy as a choice. It is a decision. Paul didn't have to wait on the outcome of the trial to determine his outlook. You could imprison his body, but you couldn't imprison his joy. You could put him in chains, but you couldn't chain his mind. If it's me, and I'm writing this letter, and if you notice how Paul begins in verse 12, if I'm writing the letter, I probably begin with how I'm doing. Paul, much more spiritual than me, he, he begins not by talking about how he's doing, but how the mission is doing. Look at what he says in verse 12, Philippians 1.12. My dear friends, I want you to know that what has happened to me has helped to spread the good news. Again, if I'm writing this, it would have started, my dear friends, I want you to know that what has happened to me has been a travesty, a miscarriage of justice. I'm innocent, I tell you. <laughs> but for Paul, the mission transcends his circumstances. He's in chains, but the good news is not. He's not thinking about what's being done to him. He's thinking about what's being done through him. Not what's done to him, but what's done through him. Case in point, he used a very interesting word. If you notice there in this passage in verse 12, my dear friends, I want you to know that what has happened to me has helped to spread the good news. I want you to notice that word spread. It's a very interesting word. It was often used uh, in that day and time in a military sense to talk about how an advanced force would go ahead and make a way. They would clear a road, they would clear a path, they would clear away rocks and brush so that the army could advance more easily. So I want you to see what Paul is saying. He's saying, what's happened to me has actually cleared the way. It's actually made it easier for people to hear the good news, and I'm going to rejoice in that. Because he's in change, the Praetorian Guard, this elite unit which would even guard Caesar, now they know about Christ. In fact, he's going to say in, in chapter 4 and verse 22, he says, all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Now, how are there Christians in Caesar's household? How did that happen? Well, <laughs> spend a couple of years chained to the Apostle Paul, and what do you think is going to happen? I mean, who is chained to who? <laughs> who is the real prisoner there, right? The guard is chained to Paul in service to Caesar. Paul is chained to the guard in service to Christ. And he says, I rejoice because all the guards get to hear about Jesus. And I rejoice that my being in prison has emboldened other Christians so that they're, they're, they're quicker to share the good news. They're, they're ready to step up their game because I'm in prison for the Lord. And Paul goes on to say in our text that was read earlier, if you remember, some preach Christ out of sincere motives. He says, I rejoice in that. Some are doing it out of insincere motives. And he says, I rejoice in that as well. In other words, there were some people apparently who had something against Paul. There were maybe some other preachers who had something against Paul. And his imprisonment, his imprisonment was seen by them as an opportunity to discredit him and to advance their own cause, or rather to promote themselves. Paul says, while their motives are bad, apparently their message is good. So it's the right message, it's just the wrong motive. We know that because anytime anyone preached a gospel that was not the correct gospel, Paul was never, I mean, he would always correct them, right? So apparently their gospel was right, but their message was wrong. 
So they're preaching a correct gospel for bad reasons, but Paul is just excited that Jesus is being preached. By the way, does that happen today? Are there still people who preach Christ for insincere motives? Money, power, fame. Of course there are. But that's the amazing power of the gospel. When the good news is preached correctly, not even the mixed motives of those who preach it can diminish its power. Isn't that amazing? And let me tell you why that's good news. It's because I don't think there's a human being alive who is pure enough to preach from absolutely pure motives. In case you don't know it, preachers aren't perfect. 25 years with me now, you should know that, right? So Paul's point is the important thing is that Christ is preached. And he's not trying to spin it like some slick politician pretending like, you know, a bad situation is really good. That's not the power of positive thinking. This is the power of faith. Believing that God is able to bring good even out of bad. So instead of, so many of us would think, why is this happening to me? Lord, why is this happening to me? Paul focuses on how God is leveraging the situation so more people can hear about Jesus. Isn't that amazing? It's a remarkable way of thinking that gave him a no matter what joy. Joy no matter what. But I want you to notice something, and this is very, very important. This kind of continual rejoicing requires a supernatural filling. Notice what he says in Philippians 1 and verse 18. I am going to keep on rejoicing for I know that as you pray for me and as the Holy Spirit helps me, this is all going to turn out for my good. Joy, a no matter what joy, requires supernatural help. See, Paul knows this kind of joy, the kind of joy that you have, even when you're in prison, cannot be sustained without help from God. So whatever circumstance you find yourself in, whatever hard place you find yourself in, you cannot maintain joy without the prayers of the, God's people and without the help of the Spirit. See, it seems that Paul here, this is important, is connecting the ministry of the Holy Spirit with the prayers of his brothers and sisters that one of the ways we experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit is through the prayers of others. Remember, Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And what's the second one? Joy. Joy. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, not a fruit of you. So a joy, no matter what, is not something we create ourselves. It comes from the Spirit of God. And over and over in Scripture, there's a connection between God's people kneeling and being filled that experiencing the ministry of the Holy Spirit comes through the prayers of God's people. I got permission to share with you a testimony that was shared with me some months ago. Lina Honeycutt, and those of you who know her, one of the most sweetest godly ladies you'll ever meet. It was months ago I had preached a sermon. I had mentioned about the peace that is brought by the Holy Spirit and she shared with me after services that day a testimony that stuck with me. And I even said, I want to share that one day if it's okay. Called her up this last week to make sure it was still okay that I share this with you. Uh, I would mentioned the ministry of that spirit. And it prompted her to share with me an unforgettable experience she had had that week. This was right after the loss of her mom. And she had seen her mom go through an exterior, extended period of suffering that was very difficult. And Lina was having trouble getting past it. And there was a moment in her words that she was quite literally sobbing, that she was deep in grief. She said that she had prayed to God to give her some peace and she knew that there were others who had been praying for God to give her that peace. Suddenly and without warning, these are her words, Suddenly and without warning, she felt what only, could only be described as a supernatural peace descend on her. All that grief and that angst just floated away. By the way, she was smiling when she was telling me about this. A moment that Lana says was a very real moment that she would never forget. And she connected this sense of peace to the prayer of God's people. 
and to her own prayer. And that testimony stuck with me. Is there anyone here that can relate to that? Has that ever happened to you? You were in a difficult season. You were in a very tough place, maybe a dark place, and suddenly, like Lina, you felt what could only be described as a supernatural peace, a supernatural joy descend on you, this sense of calm, this unexplainable joy. You know what was happening? Somebody was praying for you, and the Holy Spirit responded. Somebody was praying for you, and God responded. There is this inescapable connection in Scripture between prayer and the filling of the Spirit and this no matter what joy. In Acts chapter 13, uh, we read some Jews instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they were, they, were ran out of, they, they were run out of town, which, by the way, was just a normal Thursday for Paul, right? <laughs> he was run out of town. And verse 52 says... And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. I love the way I heard one minister put it, and I wrote it down. He said, joy and the Holy Spirit are buddies. They always travel together. Wherever you find one, you find the other. To, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with joy. Last week, I read about some aspiring psychiatrists who had attended their first class on emotional extremes. And the professor began that class with these future psychiatrists by, by asking one of the students, he said to one of the students, just to establish some parameters, what is the opposite of joy? Sadness, came the reply. And what is the opposite of depression? The student thought for a minute. She said, elation. The professor said, good. He said, what about the opposite of woe? And the student replied, I believe, sir, that is giddy up. <laughs> Try to throw in a little humor there for you. you know, most people think, on a serious note, most people think that the opposite of joy is sadness. But if you think that, you would be absolutely wrong. And let me, let me tell you why. The opposite of joy is not sadness because you can have grief and you can have joy at the same time. Some of you have experienced that. You've been to a funeral of a loved one where you were experiencing joy over the fact that they were with you at the time, but you also, I mean, sadness rather than the fact they weren't with you at the time, but joy over the fact that you knew you would see them again. You see, the two are not incompatible. Maybe you've had the experience of, like my wife and I have of dropping your kids off at college. Lane cried for an hour after we dropped our daughter off at Harding. And at the same time, you're, you're proud of them. You have this incredible sense of joy at the accomplishment and where they're going in their life. Maybe you've walked your daughter down the aisle to give her hand away in marriage and felt both sadness and joy at the same time. See, the opposite of joy is not sadness. It is fear. Wherever worry and anxiety is present, there is no joy. Philippians 1 and verse 20, Paul writes, I expect and hope that I will not fail Christ in anything, but that I will have the courage now as always to show the greatness of Christ in my life here on earth, whether I live or die. What's Paul saying? Paul is saying, you know, kill me or turn me loose. It doesn't matter. Either way, Christ is going to be glorified. For Paul Neither outcome has an effect on his joy. It is a win-win situation. He says in the very next verses, and I'm going to paraphrase it here, but Paul says, you know, kill me and I go to be with Jesus. Release me and I go on preaching Jesus. Which one is best? Kill me or turn me loose? He said, I'm not sure. One is really beneficial for me. It sounds very appealing. The other one is very beneficial for you, and I also like that option. So the companion of joy is courage. The enemy of joy is fear. You couldn't shake Paul's joy because you couldn't shake his courage. In fact, Philippians 1.21, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How many of you can honestly say that? To live is Christ and to die is gain. Let me ask you, how would you fill in these blanks? To live is blank. And to die is blank. 
How would you feel that? People are filling these in, by the way, every day. They're not just Christians. People are filling this in every day. To live is what? Some people say to live is so important. To live is me. To live is everything. To die, to die is tragic. To die is unacceptable, at least without a fight. In, or in the words of Dylan Thomas, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. To live is everything and to die is tragic. That's what some people would say. Or they would say, to live is to make money and to die is to leave it all to somebody else. <laughs> to live is to be famous. To die is to be quickly forgotten. To live is to have influence, to be an influencer. To die is to have none. How are you filling in those blanks? Because I guarantee you, you are filling them in every day. Are you filling in those blanks with something that can give you joy no matter what? Even if you die, can give you joy. Because no matter what joy is rooted in the one thing that the future can only enhance but never take away. Can I say that one more time? The future, your joy is rooted in the one thing that the future can only enhance but never take away. Paul has no idea how this trial for his life is going to turn out, but he knows how it's all going to end. To live is Christ and to die is gain. How do you take away the joy from someone who thinks like that? How do you discourage someone who has that much hope? The Apostle Paul went through a whole lot of things he didn't choose, but there was nothing that could stop him from choosing joy. All of his prayer. Here's Paul's prayer as we close. His prayer in Romans 15 and verse 13. He said, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of of the Holy Spirit. Notice that Paul says, being filled completely with joy is a result of completely trusting in God. I know there's some people here this morning and who are here in person, even watching online. You're going through a situation right now you never would have chosen for yourself. You're going through a difficult time, a very dark time. It may be horrible things that you're experiencing. But nothing can ever keep you from experiencing joy because Jesus has chosen you. Who you are exceeds any of your circumstances, right? You are in Christ.